Hi, and welcome to a very special edition of Frankly Wines in the Time of Corona. Um, those of you who've been tasting along with us know that we've been doing a tour of Italy. Uh, we kicked it off in the Northwest in the Val d'Aosta, and we kind of went, poured through Piedmont, north to south, and we spun out onto the Mediterranean in Liguria. Um, if you've been tasting, you'll notice there's been a consistent back label, and that has been for Rosenthal Wine Merchants. And today, I am very, very thrilled to be joined with Neil Rosenthal, the man himself who's 30 plus years of championing these wines is the reason that people like myself even know about them and are in turn turning you on to them. So Neil, thank you so much for being My here. Um, we've I'm just, we've known each other for many years actually at this point. I, think. I know. <laughs> I think that's the only reason you agreed to this. No. <laughs> All right. So no, I'm going to jump right in here. And uh, I would just like to ask you, so first off, how did you originally become acquainted with these wines? And what was it about these wines from, you know, Northwest Italy that really kind of captured your heart? Well, I, I, um, I had a, an interesting epiphany, actually, when I started. I was buying from my wine shop. That's how I got into this, because I, I had left the practice of law back in 1977 and set up a little wine shop in, on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Uh, and I became friendly with a, a, an Italian rogue, a Neapolitan fellow by the name of Nino Aita. And he and I became very, very friendly. And he was, and I was his biggest customer, even though I was buying more wine than I could sell, uh, which is a typical problem I always have. I've had it now for 40 years, um, but um, of having an, a larger appetite. But um, we, he dragged, he convinced me, I had to go over to Italy with him because we were going to sort of buy wine together. And I was buying really for the purpose of filling up my own shop without any idea of ultimately distributing wines across the country. Uh, that is something that evolved sort of organically that I had no intention of originally. I didn't think I was going to be in the wine business very long, frankly. Uh, and it just became, ah. sort of, it, it, it became a, 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 um, a disease of sorts, but a happy one. And so we went over to Italy together and he, um, he was married to a woman from Aquitaine in, uh, in Piedmont. And so that's where we started. And we just spent days together in early January of 1980, visiting places, uh, including my two original, my three original growers that I bought and bought wine from and used Nino's services to clear the wine in for me for the store. And those three growers, two of whom are still with me to this day, which is to say 40 years later, the first being Luigi Ferrando and now his sons Roberto yeah. and Andrea from the fabulous and unique and one of a kind wine, Carema. Uh, and also the Anfosso family, which is to say De Fourville, the De Fourville estate in Barbaresco. So yeah. we have yeah. been working together for over 40 years. Um, and my fascination with Piedmont really is my fascination with Nebbiolo, which for me from the very, very beginning had took its place alongside Pinot Noir as my sort of the holy grail for me, the kinds of wines that I really, really love, the complexity, the, the beautiful balance, the high acidity. Um, and it just, you know, the Northwest of, of Italy just was a charm for me. And I had extraordinary wines from there, in my initial experiences. And in fact, one of my original wines I brought in in 1980 at that time was the Chambav Rouge from Ezio Voyat. You know, we did Which the doesn't Blanc. doesn't exist anymore, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we did the Blanc, though, in our Valdosta tasting. So oh, really? Yes, yes. Yes. The wonderful family, the Voyat family, just a wonderful, wonderful family. A.T. and I became very, very friendly. The Chambard Rouge is a, is a really a one-off wine, uh, an extraordinary example of what the Valdosta can do. I still have my last bottle of the 1961 that I bought in 1980. I, I bought a lot of the 1961, which is really an extraordinary wine, remains extraordinary, sort of the eternal uh, fountain of youth. And that's what you know, just was my fascination for me in the Northwest. And, and shortly thereafter, my next trip through, I ended up working with the Brovia family in Cerro Lunga d'Alba. And so that was my original quartet of growers from the Northwest, three cool. of whom were with me. Yep. So now at what point were you, did you realize that you needed to be bringing in these wines from more than just your store, but really like to be able to bring them in so that the masses in America, so you could well, Liz, you know, I, I, To be honest with you, I, I'm not a great businessman and I had no real intention to do this. This sort of grew on me. It happened organically uh, because I had the store. The store was not terribly successful. It was the only pure wine shop in New York uh, there were all the other stores were basically liquor stores that happened to sell some wine. 
This was back in, I started in 1977, 78. And uh, we were just sort of, you know, you know, just barely surviving. Uh, but s some people in the neighborhood and some restaurants got wind of what I was doing and they would start to come over to the shop and say, hey, how can we get these wines? And there was a lovely little restaurant, right, a very high class French restaurant called Le Plaisir on Lexington Avenue between 70th and 71st Street, Steve Spector, and he loved the stuff and he wanted to put it in his restaurant. And then there was a place called Hubert's downtown in Brooklyn and it ultimately anyway it started like this and then people started to come up and I heard from other retailers in other parts of the country how can I get your wine and that's how the whole importing started that's awesome and sort of morphed from retail into into importing and distributing and now we're in 44 states in the District of Columbia yeah <laughs> well place. and you yeah. have generations of people beyond no, who, yes. that you've created as you know, yeah. might never reach your store, but they've been able to be yeah. uh, connected with the wines. I actually also, I got to go to Ferrando, totally. Um, we like called on a Saturday. I This was right. in 2009. I think we had just enough uh, Italian to charm them. And I next, you know, I was having lunch with Luigi and Roberto. It was great. Right. They are my closest friends. And in fact, I mean, as you can see from the dates, you mentioned 30 plus years, but it's now 40 plus years. That I know. So. That was when the book was written. Yeah, that, right, exactly. I feel like that was 10 years ago. Um, that, was, yeah, that was back, actually, the book came out in 2009. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Um, so when, okay, so you kind of just answered my next question, which was how did the American market react? But it sounds like you were acting on what, what was already being asked of you. Um, Liz, so, actually, actually, the market didn't react at all. <laughs> I was really almost broke at that time. And in fact, I've always bought wine just for myself. I never bought wine for the market. I never thought about selling to quote the masses or the general public, but it just, it's happened. It's been a great run. It's been a great ride and, and um, it's been thrilling to me. And so it's been nice, but I never had, I never had a game plan as it were. Okay. Um, but still, I, you have managed to um, retain these relationships for a long yeah. time and yeah. I would say that your portfolio still has a lot of focus. And again, that's basically your palette. So if you had to explain the Rosenthal wine, uh, what the focus is of the direction of your book. There is a singular, a singular obsession, and that is with terroir. And my understanding, and it's interpreted, the concept of terroir is interpreted through my own palette. So for me, a wine has to, in order to get into the portfolio, it must be a pure expression of its terroir. It has to state its geologic and historical and familial identity. Uh, anything that veers from that, anything that's manipulated, anything that is sort of outside of that paradigm does not fit with us. So we try and have a singular focus. It is the first question we ask and it's the last question we ask. And the only way to get that done, in my opinion, is to work with the state bottled wines. Mm -hmm. And so we have restricted our work essentially to a state bottled wines, that family run domains that have limited production and are true to their uh, origins. And that's really the funny thing. Plus, my palate requires wines of, of an excellent balance because balance is something that I feel is fundamental, not just in wine, but in everything we do. I'm a firm believer that the Zen of our existence is in balance. We're always seeking that perfect equilibrium. We're rarely there, but we're always looking for it. And wine is, and that's exactly the same principle I apply to looking for wine. Yeah, but you've also, in doing so, you've retained, I mean, you really have one of the books that, especially in France and in Italy, you've retained growers. They have worked with you for years. Right. Right. And so I feel that that obviously works in your philosophy as well. And yes. I have to ask relationships. They're very, they are very important in the industry. Look, look, it's, it's, it's the same thing between you and me right now, right? Yeah. We met how many years ago and, and here we are still working together. It's a question of mutual respect. It's not only mutual respect, but it's also sharing values. Mm -hmm. You have to have those two things without that nothing works. And I'm still a believer, even in this high tech age, nothing replaces the personal relationship. Nothing replaces the handshake that may be going by the boards after this, after this medical crisis we're in right now. But, but I just, I believe in that kind of personal, the personal relationships are very fundamental to this, 
success certainly of my enterprise. The relationships with my growers, relationship with our clients, relationships with my teammates, it's all a very personal thing. And you have to have shared values and you have that mutual respect. Yes. Well, after this, we're going to jump on to a live tasting with Clark, who I know has been with you for at least probably 10 years now because he yeah. has been my rep since he started uh, when I was at Myelino. So, um, and Clark, and Clark and Clark actually, not only is he, does he sell wine for us, but he is part of our educational team. He does a fundamental, plays a fundamental role in, in, our, in our little um, team concept of, of, of producing the kind of uh, material that gets people to understand who we are. Well, that's so I think great. you're going to have a good time. And I would love to, I'd love to join you at some point in time. Anytime you want me to hop in on a call with your clients, let me know. Great. And, I believe, and I believe this little Zoom thing is going to continue after the, after the pandemic is over. I do too. I think that we're looking at a different way of selling wine moving forward. And in some ways it's really nice because I, 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 I hope that everyone understands that it's really people like yourself who have fed, who have helped curate the programs that people like me came up on. And it's really thanks to people like you for helping create the market the market as much as you don't want it to exist. Right now, hey, they, oh, happy, I'm happy to see the market develop. Believe me, this business has been exceptionally good to me. So, yeah. so right. thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much, Neil. If one K, last line. Yeah, we sure, you bet. What's your takeaway? What do you want everyone to think of when they think of the Valdosta and Piedmont and even these Ligurian reds, like, or, or not reds, sorry, wines? What is the, just the takeaway? I think it's, the takeaway is, the individual grower, the passion, the love, the joy, and, and the fact that this is handwork that requires a complete and total dedication. And one must, at some point in time, visit these places to understand the extraordinary, the extraordinary physical beauty that goes along with this. And, and when you see where these vineyards are, you will understand the majesty of the wines. Yes. These are really, they're stunning places. I've fortunately yeah. seen them all. Nothing, nothing quite like it. Yeah. So thanks, Liz. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for the support. Thank you so much, Neil. We'll see you Take later. Care. Bye. Hello Thanks. to everybody. Bye. Bye.